Y'all, when I turned this documentary on, I did not expect to get slapped across the face with a cringe fest, with a what in the hey diddle diddle did I just watch? And I burned through all three episodes of it. Now, what I'm talking about today is the new Netflix docu-series, documentary, whatever you want to call it, uh, I Am A Killer, released. Now, this is like an offshoot of the series I Am A Killer. It is following someone who was a killer and got released, hence the name. Now, y'all, moving forward, spoiler alert right here, psh, 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 all across your face. If you don't want to know, like, the big, oh, my God, then go on and quit watch. But if you do want to hear my take on it when I think about it, then let's keep going. So, Dale Wayne Sigler took the life of a subway worker 30 years ago and has now been released. Now, the dynamics to this crime are complicated, and most of them are. And what this documentary is doing is kind of giving us insight into, okay, here's the case, here's essentially the twist and turns in it, and here's what it looks like with him getting out after 30 years. So let's go over the backstory real quick before we get to some of the more cringy parts. So, 1990, Dale walks into a subway shop. This kind of sounds like a bad joke to begin with, but sadly it's not. He walks into the subway shop, and when he leaves there, he would have taken someone's life, his life would be destroyed as well, and many other people's lives who cared about this victim would be destroyed. And the cash machine, the register, would be $400 shorter than it was when he went in there. So, let's talk about the actual event. So, you need to also understand about Dale first, that he basically up to this point had been like you know doing drugs partying you know petty crimes things of this nature so i mean this wasn't like a oh god i'm desperate not that that makes it better but i mean this was like you know a trajectory that dale was on now also this will become kind of like huh you know during the commission of this crime and the victim's name is john we'll get to him in just one second uh dale shoots john like six times I think three of them were after he had already collapsed on the floor. So this will become relevant here in a couple of minutes because this wasn't just a let me get the money and run. There was something else going on there. You know, as you can imagine, the violentness of this, the heinousness of it, literally shocked everybody. Dale initially was sent to old Sparky for this. And there he sat on death row waiting that out when all of a sudden some laws changed around and he had a good lawyer and the, this had to do with like jury selection stuff. And the lawyer, you know, got his case to specifically be looked at through a retroactive type way. So basically it made Dale eligible for this new law that passed, which meant that his sentence got commuted from old Sparky, you know, to a lesser sentence. Along with that automatically came the you know, opportunity for uh, parole after like 30 years, I think it was. Yeah, I'll be damned if he didn't get the parole. Now, Dale has allegedly changed his life in prison. He's an ordained minister now. You know, he found God, the whole nine yards. He cries half the time. He's very open about, you know, telling his story, uh, you know, to anyone and everyone that will listen and some that probably don't want to listen, uh, you know, and that's kind of his gig at this point. You know, he's very open about the regret that he has, the crime that he committed. So he has this like open book kind of thing to him that makes you say, Huh, okay, what, you know, this is kind of interesting. Now, he considers himself like a walking miracle, like, oh my God, you know, God touched me and now I'm here to teach the world about it. So, you know, there's that. But then it gets twisted. So the victim, John, who I was talking about, he was a gay guy. Now, in the documentary, we see and meet his uh, half-brothers. And, you know, they speak very highly of him. They didn't have an issue with the gay thing. Remember, this is like back in the 90s, so it wasn't like it was now or whatever, uh, especially in certain areas. So, you know, they were very fine. I mean, they loved their half-brother. They basically were like, look, you know what? We kind of heard that Dale, the perpetrator, might be gay too. You know, and we feel like the gay thing had something to do with what happened to our half-brother, John. Uh, you know, whether it made him snap on him or whatever, but they were like, you know what, they just basically are describing a hate crime. So there's that. They're insinuating that, you know, Dale might be gay himself, and it adds this whole other layer to the story. Also in that is that we learn that John, the perpetrator, and Dale, the victim, knew each other before this crime. So this was not just a random, oh, I walked in subway and robbed them. You know, they, they knew of each other. They knew each other. 
so there's that going on and we'll get back to that in one minute the next thing we're going to talk about before we go further is the next like major character in this film her name is carol whitworth she's a 70 year old woman uh she basically befriends dale in this and the way she does this is she's at prison prison visiting her stepson and he introduces her to dale so she talks about this she's like you know what we became pen pals we struck up a friendship and it goes from there now for me when she was describing this i was like ow okay you know this is like love after lockup you know what i'm saying we're down for it uh she's like 20 years older than him and not that that matters or anything but you know there's a visual difference in their age so you're like okay i personally got romantic vibes off of it at first but then all of a sudden she's like and he calls me mama and i was like whoa oh oh mercy whoa where we go now where this took a left hand turn so she's basically like he considers me like a second mother and i was like okay that's kind of i mean i hate to say creepy but in the context of how i was viewing it it was creepy to me uh so there was that now their relationship grows so close that she's like you know what you can parole out to my home and live with me for like the first year that you're out i'm willing to do that for you which i thought that was pretty amazing of her and honestly my red flags went up because i was like this guy is working her over he is working her over he knows she's lonely and he is taking advantage now another thing of interest with carol that i was just like girl uh we might want to double check on that basically during the interviews because it's mostly what this is made up of it's like interviews with the director and whatnot and she basically didn't even really know what he did i mean she knew that he was in there on you know the big m charge but she didn't really know the details of it and part of me was like oh, that's you know sweet i guess but then also i was worried for her because she does have like a grandson of his wife that comes over and stuff and they're not too cool with this you know i was just like you know i'm glad that somebody was there watching out because i felt like carol was so open and honest and like a little naive that I was very feel fearful for her to be taken advantage of or worse. So now you basically have all the working components of this documentary. So that's essentially episode one. You know, now episode two, they drop a bombshell and you're just like, ow. Okay. Now again, here comes the spoiler alert. So if you're not wanting to vibe with the spoiler alert, go on, go on. We'll see you later. So remember how I said that the victim, John, was gay and that, that he knew Dale? So Dale is now coming out. Remember, this is 30 years later. He is saying that the victim, John, was going to blackmail him into a homosexual relationship. And this essentially caused him to snap because he had nothing left to lose but his reputation. And this is why he ended up taking the life of John. So that right there completely turns the story upside down because in trial he said it was a robbery thing and so now 30 years later he's like no that wasn't the truth and you know I should be able to speak the truth and da 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 you know and it's kind of like okay well why wouldn't you have said that then if you were so concerned about your reputation you know and him doing that that you're willing to throw your life away over it you know why wouldn't you have said that in in court unless people had some dirty stuff to say on him so there was that that is the entire thread. it throws the whole movie upside down essentially you see him you know he's going to this church and whatnot and i mean people are kind of on his side to a degree like even the grandson's like i mean i probably would have done the same thing if somebody was you know trying to blackmail me like that and i'm just kind of like really like and one of the attorneys that was watching the other, he worked in the case and he's re-watching this. And he's like, first of all, I don't believe this at all. This is a lie. But he's like, you know, who am I to say it's a lie? He's like, I wasn't there. I can't say. But he's like, I really have a hard time believing this is true. And he was like, even if it is true, that's why would you go take someone's life over that? I mean, really? And I, I agree with that question. I mean, it, it's true. This is what I think happened. I don't have proof of this. I wasn't there. This is the Sofa Squad opinion. I think that... Now, it is possible. Let me let me back up here. It's possible that they could have had something going on on the download. We see this all the time. You know what I'm saying? Where the dude can't handle it, whatever, and so this happens. You know, so there's that. It's possible that he did try and blackmail him. Again, I don't know. I personally think that Dale was already living this life of crime and petty stuff and robbing things and yada, yada, yada. He knew this dude was gay. He knew it was an easy mark. He knew him. He could go in there. 
and I think he went in there and w took advantage of the situation and did away with him and then took the $400. I think he was probably disgusted by him and that's why he put so many bullets in him. You know, I mean, that's just my take on it. I could be wrong. If you know more information out there about this case and you want to throw your two cents in, like if you were there, like, you know, you lived in that area, whatever, you know the tea on a local level, drop it like it's hot in the comment section. So that's it. I just definitely suggest watching this. Definitely check it out. You will rip through it. You will enjoy it. You'll laugh. You'll cry. You'll freaking horror. But regardless, come let me know what you think about it. Thank you for watching. Check out my other videos. I'll talk to you soon.